Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I'm in. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. So, so remember the the colon con the colon question mark construct. So. So what? So we have. Uh, so we have say, a, um, is assigned. Uh, we have the. Uh, let's see. Let me let me just make sure I get that correct. So I don't. Uh, Mess that up. That is one syntax for some reason I tend to forget. So So, uh, let's see, is this it? Uh, uh, yeah, so here's, here's, here is, uh, here's the construct right here. And, and this is really helpful for doing muxes without having to use a, a the bastardized use of the always block. So here we assign this signal w underscore test one equals uh, this is the test. So we're going to test this R check. If it's true, then we're going to assign this, which is the constant one, one bit one to this one bit w underscore test one. If R check is false, we're going to assign zero. Now, what's interesting here is you can, uh, and again, W test would have to be a wire because it's in the left side of an assigned statement. Our check can be anything. In this case, it's a register. And um, so we, we test this signal. And again, if it's true, then the first value after the question mark is assigned to the output. And if it's false, this value after the colon is assigned. Now, you can nest these uh, statements just fine. So for instance, if you want to do a, a mux, let's go back to here. So if you want to do, do a mux, uh, so let's say, let's say we have a mux, um, we'll do the four to one mux, for instance. Uh, so the output, let's say the output is uh, F and F equals, um, and we have, uh, so the output's F, let me just define all the variables. Then we have our two uh, select statements, S-E-L-A and S-E-L-B. And then we have our inputs, I-0, I-1, I-2, and I-3. Okay, so, so that would be our standard four to one mux with F out, A and B, going in with cell A and cell B. And then we have our four I's, zero, one, two, three. All right, so how would we write that using this, this the, 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 uh, the question mark colon construct? So what, what you can say is you can say F equals, um, first you test B, B or F cell, S E L B question mark. And then we're going to test. Uh, so if, if, if cell B is true, um, actually maybe we do cell A. If cell A is true, then we test cell B. And then if cell B is true, then we're going to use I3. Otherwise, we'll use I2. And then colon, we'll test cell B again. And if it's, so now this is if cell A is false, after the colon cell, then cell uh, B, we test it again. And if it's, if it's true, then we're going to use I1, but if it's false, will be I0. So I0 would then result in 
the case where A is false and B is false, which would be the zero, zero condition. I1 would be where A is false, B is true, the zero, one. I2 is where A is true, B is false, the one, zero, and I3 is one, one. And so it, it all works out. The only thing you have to do is you just have to, re, to do a little thinking about whether you test cell A out here and B inside two times, or cell B out here and A inside two times. But it, it's correct to do cell A and then B out here. So that's one way you can answer the first question in the homework. Professor. Yeah. Cell B is the least significant? Yes. Bit? OK, cool. Yeah. OK, and then let's see. So I wanted to get that right. And then, OK, and then we talked a lot about inertial delay and transport delay. So the inertial delay is the same as the propagation delay. The transport delay is basically the time going through the wire and the interconnection matrix in an FPGA. The transport delay propagates uh, glitches. The inertial delay does not propagate in, in the simulator. In the real world, who knows what happens exactly, but generally the inertial delay won't propagate even in the real world, uh, a glitch that is significantly shorter than the inertial delay. But if it's close to the same length, then probably you would see some change in the output. Um, but, but for the simulator, the simulator will transmit glitches that are shorter than the transport delay, but the inertial delay will not. So the inertial delay does act as a bit of a glitch filter. Uh, so three, you, you apply a five nanosecond uh, a1 pulse to signal A, or A equals one pulse to signal A, where B equals one, draw the resultant timing diagram for A and C. So, so, so basically this is A anded with B. So B is one. So when A goes up for five nanoseconds to one, what happens? Well, C, so is this, a, is this 10 nanoseconds a transport delay or is this a, um, inertial delay. Well, because it's on the left of the equal sign, it is inertial delay. So it's going to, they, they would work the same, but, but since this five nanosecond pulse is significantly shorter than this 10 nanoseconds, it's not going to be transmitted through the inertial delay. So basically the resultant time, timing diagram for C is just going to be a straight line staying on zero. Whereas the uh, resultant uh, timing for A is you're going to see a five nanosecond pulse and then it's going to go back to zero and continue down at zero. So write the Verilog code for a six bit adder using a full one bit adder modules. So what you have to do is you take uh, uh, instantiate. So write your full one bit adder module. You can copy that out of the notes and then instantiate six copies of it to get a six bit adder. And that's pretty straightforward. Remember, you have to do the same as we did for the four bit adder, only you just have to add two more bits. The, the initial carry in would be in the external port list and the final carry out would be, but the internal carries from the six full adders as they propagate the carry through from the first adder to the last adder, those, those uh, internal signals would only appear within the module and not in the external port list. So your external por port list would have six bits of A, six bits of B, six bits of sum, a carry in and a carry out. And your internal signals, you would have, uh, you, you have five internal signals, a carry from the, from the first adder to the second, the second to the third, the third to the fourth, the fourth to the fifth, and the fifth to the sixth. But, uh, and that's five internal signals. And you can call them whatever you want. Um, all right, so that's the homework. Any questions on that? For for the last question, yeah, um, do we need like the test bench, like to write out like the test bench as well, or is, do you just want the the regular code that you'd have in your main file? Yeah, I didn't ask for the test bench, but if you want to if you want to try your hand at that too, that's a good idea. But it's not yeah. required. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody, good. All right, let's uh, fire up then the. So we, we talked about operators. Uh, I just wanted to go through this real quickly. We are a little bit behind and keep moving. So 
remember we have the logical and bitwise, double ampersand, double uh, vertical bar are the logical and logical or single single ampersand and single bar are the bitwise. For single bits, they're the same, but for vectors, they're obviously different. So keep that in mind, don't make that mistake. The uh, logical knot is the, uh, is the explanation point. The bitwise knot is the tilde. And then we have the exclusive or and the exclusive nor. Uh, the exclusive nor can be represented uh, as the caret tilde or tilde caret. And uh, there's no there's no bitwise uh, there's no logical exclusive or. I guess there could be, but anyway, there isn't in very long. Uh, yeah, there's some interesting discussions about that. I I think it's the same in C. I don't think it's in C either. And there was a uh, I think Kara, they asked Kerrigan some questions about that, and and it's 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 not used very much, and that's why they didn't put it in apparently. Uh, but I guess you you could have a logical, you could have a logical, um, you, you certainly could have a logical um, uh, exclusive or. All right, relational operators. So remember, if you just put a single equal sign, then you actually uh, you actually do set you actually uh, can change the value of things. So you if you just want to compare them, you do the double equals. Hey, Dr. Morton, should we be able to uh, see your screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, hell. I, I don't know why I have trouble remembering to flip it back when I do. Okay. All right. So logical, relational. Uh, the sh and remember the exclusive or can be the exclusive nor can be either way. Uh, and then the shifts. And uh, so um, there, we looked it up on the web and it, it claims that the arithmetic uh, shift right, or sorry, the arithmetic shift left is the same as the logical shift left, but there are other references that, that dispute that. So I'll just, I'll just defer and say that uh, it, it is, it is compiler dependent, uh, simulate synthesizer dependent. So you want to, so you, what you should do is do a little test operation. If, if it's, you know, if it's a life and death thing and you have questions like this, you just should do a, a little, little snippet of code put it on your board and see what happens. And then you'll know for sure. Uh, but all the rest of them are pretty straightforward. This, this The double carats or the double less than, double greater than uh, shift in zeros for the missing bits. And, uh, but the triple, when you arithmetically shift right, you replicate the sign bit. So if it's a one, you shift in ones. If it's a zero, you shift in zeros. The, the, the left shift is debatable. Sometimes it replicates the lower order digit. Sometimes it doesn't. Depends on the simulator, the, the synthesizer. Okay, and then uh, re remember um, plus minus and then concatenation. You can add and you can subtract uh, bit vectors, but uh, but you can't multiply them, divide them. Uh, uh, you can't do the, the modulus and you can't uh, take them to a power. Remember that this is in uh, six as the highest precedence and one has the lowest. Uh, so if you don't use parentheses, uh, that's the order of precedence. And for the love of God, use parentheses because then you get really crazy stuff that's very hard to make sure to read correctly. Um, so uh, we talked about those. So, uh, so here's some examples. Uh, if, you have, if A is 110 and B is 111, and C is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and D is 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Then if you concatenate A and B, so A with the inverse of B, then you would get 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then you R that with C, shifted to, now notice because there's no, uh, there's parentheses around the whole thing, but there's, it's just, you, you have to know the order of precedence. So that's, I'm not going to go through this, but you can walk yourself through this. And then, then it asks, uh, is this side equal to this side? And so here's the order, tilde first, concatenation next, uh, shift operator next, or, and then and, and then the equal sign here because of the parentheses. So you can walk through that, but this, this, this gives you one, one, zero, 
zero zero zero, and uh, so the B is going to be negated, and then the two will be concatenated first. Then then that's going to be shifted. Um, then the the C I guess is going to be shifted uh, two places right, and then it's going to be uh, ORed with C. Um, it's a little confusing. Anyway, you can work it out on paper. This is the answer you should get when you work. And this is a great example of why uh, not using parentheses is, is a terrible idea. You should always put in the parentheses to make it totally clear what your intent is here. Did you want all this to happen or it was C and then shift the result? Because if that's what you wanted, that's not what you're getting here. I think it shifts C first and then it uh, and then it, and then it does it concatenates it negates B and concatenates them both, and then then it shifts C and then ors them together. Anyway, turns out it they they are equal. Okay, and then here's here's where uh, so logical arithmetic. Uh, so here we have logical shift fill with zeros left fill shift right three places fill with three zeros. Here, notice they're showing a left shift filling, replicating the low order bit. And here they're replicating the higher order bit. Again, we looked it up the other day on the web and it said, it said that it should fill with zeros. So now you have two different opinions, but I think the, uh, I think the Roth book uh, says it fills with ones. Okay, arithmetic operators, uh, plus and minus, you can apply those to, any types, integer, real, numeric operands, and then bit or bit vectors. So you can use these with bit vectors. Uh, obviously, the concatenation operator, it, it can concatenate two vectors, or it can concatenate a vector and a bit, or a bit and a vector. That's all fine. It can concatenate constants as well. So here, notice here, this, this constant, tick one, uh, is, um, Yeah, these are, so these are, they're using these as constants. I don't know, that that's kind of goofy notation. Use the correct notation for constants. But here you concatenate letters. Uh, I don't know what variable you would store these letters in. I guess those are signals, A, B, C, and D, E, F, yeah, I guess so. All right, well, anyway. Uh, so arithmetic operators, you have to use only on integer or floating point operands. Can't use them on bit vectors. And same with modulus. And uh, modulus only useful on integer operands. Can't use them on floats, obviously. And uh, raising to a power, integers or floats. But you can't use these operators on bit vectors. All right. So let's, let's uh, get rid of this one and do this one. Okay, so we got some more to do, so we'll get through this. So, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about synthesis. We'll come back and, and cover some more examples of synthesis. Of course, that's why we're doing the lab. The lab, the lab is really important because it, it lets you synthesize your code uh, and actually put it on the board and see what happens. And that's super important because you can write all sorts of legal code that won't synthesize. And you have to sort of learn what, what some of the tricks and, and they are synthesizer dependent, every synthesizer. So if you're making, if you're making integrated circuits in a foundry and you're, set in, and you're writing the Verilog code for that to create the, the photo mask and all that, and all the various steps, that's, that's, that's synthesizer is gonna behave pretty differently than one making a bit file for an FPGA. So in our case, we're making bit files using the Xilinx synthesizer for their, for their chips, for their FPGAs. But it's not gonna work the same. And it's, it's gonna do things that you can't do if you're making chips. And it's gonna not do things that you can do if you're making chips. So they're very, very synthesizer dependent. All right, so remember these tools, this synthesizer makes hardware from, from Verilog code very powerful uh that's where that's where the magic really is and that's what's allowing 
uh, the industry to make incredibly complicated circuits with billions of transistors. Truly amazing. When you couldn't even draw the schematic or, you know, when the schematic would take multiple square miles. Okay, so you have to follow some certain conventions. Poorly written Verilog code may not give you what you want. So here's some differences between simulation and synthesis. Uh, for starters, this, this, well, is this an inertial delay or is this a transport delay? Transport. transport. That's right. It's a transport delay. It's on the right side. Okay. So does this simulate? Absolutely not. I mean, uh, does this sim it only simulates? Uh, it does it synthesize? No, absolutely not. Okay, so we have external port list, A, B, C, input A, up, input B, output C. We have, we've called C a register. Why is that? Well, it appears on the left side in the always block, so it must be a register. And then notice here we have uh, one variable in the, in, the, in the sensitivity list in the always block, A. We don't have B in there, so, so it's theoretically wouldn't execute on B. Is, is the A a level signal or an edge signal? Clearly, it's a level signal, but you have a non and you have a non-blocking assignment here with this five nanosecond transport delay. Okay, so so what's going to happen with this? So this is A order of B. So most synthesis tools will output an OR gate, and they'll probably give a warning that B is not in the sensitivity list, since obviously the, the OR gate's not going to work correctly because B will change, and in theory, it wouldn't change the output C. Remember, what's going to happen here is it's not going to give you, even though you've called C a register, it's not going to make C a register. And even though you've uh, put this in an always block, it's not going to give you combinational logic or uh, sequential logic. It's going to, it's, this is an example of a bastardized use of the always block, and it's going to result in combinational logic. But because you didn't put B in the port list, it would probably give you an error. And the synthesizer, of course, totally ignores uh, the five nanosecond. Uh, transport delay because we never synthesize our delays. We use them in simulation, but not in synthesis. So, and this is probably what you'd get. Professor. Yeah. If you were to use a non-blocking assignment and let's say add another assignment statement below that with a different variable, like an output D, would that be, comp I mean, sequential or no? No. The so the, the yeah the, so the rules are in in this case because you use the level signal here and uh what what this is is basically an or gate so there's really no there's really no sequential nature to it at all there's no clock um okay. there's no edge signal so it's gonna that's why it wouldn't just interpret it as an or gate i mean why would you really do that i mean it's silly you, you you, in this case, obviously, you'd just do an assigned statement. You'd make C a wire, and you'd be done with it. Uh, yeah. But, but people do stuff like this, and I, I, you know, that that's my one little pet peeve with very long. Uh, it in in VHDL, you, you can't do this kind of stuff. Uh, so it's a little cleaner in that regard. But people prefer very long because it's a little more flexible. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, so here's another synthesis example. Um, so what do so so what do you think? Well, so what's going on here? Well, first we do have a clock. Okay, so now we think, okay, we probably we probably intend sequential logic here, and uh, so we have two things. We have A ended with B giving us C. C ended with a, or ORed with F giving us G. So. Um, so what's going to happen? So is this circuit going to be, and notice that C is an output here and input there. And again, uh, C is an internal signal, doesn't appear in our external port list. So what's going to happen? So we have this device here, the black box. We have a clock input. We have an F. Uh, we have an A, a B, and we have a D output. Uh, I don't see the D. 
Yeah, what's the deal? Yeah, there's no D specified there. I think it's supposed to be the G. Yeah, I think it is. You're right, G, right. And uh, yeah, it's the G. And the C is an internal signal. So what, what, they're, what they're intending here is a cascade of two gates, right? So, so let's look. So the positive, the positive edge clock implies an edge triggered clock. So if that's the case, then since we're, we specified registers, we have an edge triggered clock, the synthesizer is gonna take this and, and assume that you are implying uh, that, that the value of C has to be stored in a flip-flop and the output of G as well. So it's gonna create two edge triggered flip-flops and it's gonna set them up like this. So that's really what you're making. You're not making a cascade of two gates. You're making, you're, you're interjecting two flip-flops when you put it in an always block. And that's why when you use an edge signal, and you use non-blocking, then the synthesizer is gonna, gonna try and interpret that as a sequential device. All right, multiplexer. So uh, two-bit uh, two multiplexer, that's what we did in lab this week or what we're doing in lab. Control signal A, IO, I1, and an output F. And here's your thing, A prime I0 or A I1. You can also do this with this, uh, uh, well, you can do this with this conditional assign statement, just like this. A prime ended with I zero or A ended with one. And again, we're using the logical values here, but you could, since they're bits, you can use the bits as well, same thing. Or you can use this assign statement that we just talked about. F gets, you evaluate signal A, if it's true, you assign I1, that would be A equals one. If it's false, A equals zero, you assign I zero. This is very powerful. You should definitely make it a habit to incorporate this in your code. And it, it definitely saves you using the always blocks for these bastardized combinational circuits. Uh, it's a lot more readable in my view, most of the time, not always. Sometimes it's not as readable. All right. And here's the, here's the format for that. We just went over that, I, I should have waited, but anyway. So you're, the, the signal you're gonna assign, the condition you're testing, expression of true, expression of false. And you can nest these as deep as you want. Cascade two to one muxes. So you can do that quite easily with, the, with that statement right here. We put the second one in parentheses. So if, if E is true, we'll just assign A. So that's here. So E is this uh, signal. And then if E is false, then we're gonna evaluate this MUX and assign the result of that using D as our test, B if it's true, C if it's false. And here's a four to one, same thing. And we just did this. There's the, there, there, and you can write this either way, right? You can write this out like this with an assigned statement using your operators, or you can use your conditional assignment like that. To me, this is more readable. But you can also argue this is pretty readable here. Now, the one thing that's key is you have to specify all the possibilities. If you leave one possibility out, then if you specify all the possibilities like they did here, this always block will result in combinational, a combinational circuit. And so it, it'll, the synthesizer will look at this and go, okay, well, what you really intended was a MUX. But if you leave one of these out, it'll create a latch to hold that value to the next time this executes. And then you won't have a combinational circuit anymore. So you, you have to be careful when you use it in this bastardized form, because if you, if you leave out one of these one of these options, then you have to create a latch. So here they specified for all four, so that's fine. So, and cell of course is a two bit vector. So professor, you could do a vector for the conditional statement just as long as you embed each individual bit 
and the possibility of it, right? Yeah. Somewhere, okay. somewhere a cell has to, has to be defined as a two-bit vector. Okay. Outside of the always block. Okay. And then case statement, same thing. You can do this with a case statement. Again, case statement has to be in an always block. So is this more readable than say this or this? It, yeah, it probably actually is. So that's one of the reasons why people do this. And if you're careful and you specify all the cases, and you can also, there's also, you can use a default selection in the case statement. Uh, and that's probably a good thing to include too. You can just set the F equal to zero or whatever you want. But, uh, but if you specify all the possibilities and you even put a default in, then you're pretty confident that it's not gonna have problems uh, synthesizing correctly as a MUX, which is a combinational circuit. There's no clock in a MUX. But these case statements are great. You should definitely use them. They're much better than, than a whole bunch of nested ifs. All right, so let's look at this one. So we have, um, so, so, so we have, here's our module, Q1, Q2, Q3, A and clock. Input A and clock, output Q1, Q2, Q3. So Q1, Q2 and three are defined as a register because they appear on the left side in this always block. What's in our sensitivity list? It is an edge signal, it's a clock. So are we using blocking or non-blocking here? Blocking. We're using blocking. So now we have a little bit of a conundrum because the edge signal would suggest that we intend this to be sequential logic. The blocking signals suggest that maybe we really intended it to be combinational. So, and notice what's gonna happen here. A is gonna, so because these are gonna wait on each other, it's gonna execute on the positive edge of the clock. A is gonna be assigned to Q1. The new value of Q1 will be assigned to Q2. The new value of Q2 will be assigned to Q3. So when it's all said and done, everything's gonna have the value of A. So what actually gets synthesized? Well, you are gonna get a flip-flop because it's gonna be sequential logic, mostly because of this edge clock but it's probably gonna optimize away all these other things. And what it's probably gonna do is give you a single flip-flop all with the input A. Uh, if it's not optimized, it'll give you three flip-flops with all with the input A, which would be kind of useless. So, so this, if, you, if what you intended was a shift register where A goes to one, one goes to two and two goes to three, you should not have used blocking statements. You should have used non-blocking and then that's what would happen. So a good practice with some exceptions, anytime you, have a sequen anytime you intend a sequential design, use non-blocking. Anytime you use, intend a combinational design, you should use blocking. But there are exceptions to that. Usually there are, the exceptions are when you actually intend a sequential device to wait on something and then you can use a blocking statement. Okay, um, so modeling registers and counters in Verilog using an always block. All right, so here we have a shift register. We have, we have, a, a, we have say some value set in these three flip-flops and then we wanna, we wanna shift this value up here, that value there and this value down there. And so uh, with a five nanosecond delay for each flip-flop. So how do you do that? So you use an always block with an edge clock, and then you uh, use non-blocking statements with this five nanosecond transport delay. And so the old value of Q3 will be assigned to Q1. The old value of Q1 will be assigned to Q2. The old value of Q2 will be assigned to Q3. The order of these statements does not matter, and they all execute at the same time on the positive edge of the clock. But because there is this, propagation delay, there will be a five nanosecond uh, delta. These will all run at the same time. But so, so, so your, total, your total delay though, uh, well, they won't. They won't all run at the same time. Uh, so so you, you should have, it should be a, yeah, I guess they do. They all run at the same time. So the total delay should be five nanoseconds. I don't know, that's a little confusing because you use the old values 
Yeah, well, the old values, they all start at the same time. And five nanoseconds later, they should all update. Because they're using the old values, not they're not using the new values. Okay, uh, so here's a register. We have a load, we have a clear. Uh, the clear and the load are synchronous, and we have a clock. So when I, we say they're synchronous, it means that they're going to be in, they're, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to occur on the clock edge so that they will not appear in the sensitivity list. So the only thing in the sensitivity list is the clock, it's an edge. And then you test the clear. If it's true, you assign, uh, now this, this line screwed up. It should be. And then, yeah. Oh, I guess it all should have been on one line. What does not really matter? Yeah, that's what it should have been. Uh oh, anyway. Okay. Yeah, sorry. There. Okay. So if and else if. If if clear is if clear is low and load is low, nothing happens. Even even on the positive edge of the clock. So when they're synchronous, they're not in the list. When they're asynchronous, they're in the list, sensitivity list. And they also have to all be edge signals. So here you have. Uh, this is a shift register. Now, now this is going to do three things. It's going to clear on a clear, load on a load, and shift on a shift. So, so the sh so the left shift signal has to be high. So you have a load signal, left shift, and a clear. They're all active high. So if all three are low, nothing happens on the clock edge. And there is an order of precedence here. The clear is tested first. So if clear is active. You don't even test these. It tests load second, and then finally the left shift. Notice how we use the concatenation to do this. Very powerful uh, command. So we have we have three bits of Q, Q3, Q2, Q1, and Q0. So here we're taking the lower three bits of Q and appending R in at the end. So Q2 now becomes Q3, Q. Two become, Q1 becomes Q2, and Q0 becomes Q1, and Rm becomes Q0. Here we load in four bits of D, and here we load in four zeros to the clear. Okay. So if you start with 1101 and Rn is zero, after the left shift, you have 101 and a zero appended on the right, this zero. And this one is discarded. Okay, here's a here's a synchronous counter. So note note you have uh, you only have the clock here, so the clear knot is a synchronous clear knot, and the count is triggered on enable. So if the clear knot in this case is a, is the clear active low or active high. Active high? No, it's active low because there's a bubble. And the other hint is it's called the clear knot. Always, always, you know, you have to kind of keep your eye on those details. Um, all right. So we define Q as a four bit register. And, uh, and then, so that's essentially four flip flops. And our always block then edge, we have an edge clock here. So that's great. So it should be sequential. And notice we're using non blocking. We test clear, uh, we test inverse of clear. So if, if the clear knot is a zero, it would be active and the inverse of it would be a one or true. You could use a, it's a single bit, so you can use a tilde or you could use an exclamation point. Either one would give you the invert. And then uh, we assign four bits, four, four, we assign the constant of four zeros to it. Else if, if the enable is active, is it active high or low? 
Yeah, this one is high. That's right. The enable is high. So if the enable is high, then we add one to Q, which effectively is a that's our count. You can add, you can use bit vectors with addition and subtraction, but not multiplication, division, or any of the other mathematical functions. All right, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I I used to before, but so this this is a this was a standard four bit counterpart that was used all over the place. Uh, it had all sorts of interesting inputs. The data sheets really very complicated uh, because you uh, the the big problem with this was when it's counting away. You want if you let's say you have four of these daisy chained together for a sixteen bit counter. You want the outputs to all update at the same time. And you don't want them rippling along. If you have like four of these daisy chained, the outputs would always be changing. There'd never be a time where you could take a snapshot and get the count uh, if you were pushing it to the limits. And so, so they'd had features that allowed the outputs to all update at the same time, uh, which is kind of cool. But anyway, uh, kind of goofy. But it, it it does point out some of the issues that you run into uh, with with the ripple effect of counters like this. Um, so you do have to keep that in mind. If you've got a 64-bit counter and you increment it, the, the higher order bit is going to take longer to reflect its correct true state than the lower order bit will. And you have to make sure that you're not assuming something that's not true when you use the result uh, downstream. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through this, but if you if you want to look at the notes and pull this up and read about it, that would be that 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 would be useful. Um, but anyway, this gets really crazy. Um, it shows all all sorts of things. You can you can clear it. You can do a parallel load. You can put it in a hold mode, or you can take the present state and add one to it. And those are all the different options. And and here's what it looks like. Q3 at and Q2, and Q1, and Q0, and T. And that gives you the, that, that's the carry out. Carry out is just a single bit. So if all these are ones and the T is a one, then you'll generate a carry out. And that's when you ripple to the next four bit nibble. All right. Yeah. Yeah, basically it's required. Uh, again, these are, these are really, uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. It, it, this is an interesting data sheet to read, and you realize that this counter, as simple as it might seem, was, uh, was tricky to use in circuits, and you, and you had to play with it and spend quite a bit of time really becoming familiar with the details of how the P input, the enable, the T input, uh, and then uh, how these were used in a typical counting mode. And here's a, here's a very long uh, uh, module to implement this, but uh, I so for instance, if you wanted to do an eight-bit counter, you could create two of these modules and daisy chain them together. But it's so much easier to go to the next uh, level of abstraction above this and just create an eight-bit vector and add one to it. So uh, it's really interesting. But you can see in the old days when we had to use discrete parts. Uh, and we didn't have a synthesizer to do all the work for us. Uh, you had to do a lot more thinking. All right, anyway, I'm not gonna go through this anymore. I, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it. All right, synthesis tips. So remember that the signals retain the current value until change. Well, that makes sense. Uh, but you can result in unwanted latches. So, so here's, here's an example where the always blocks are used incorrectly. Notice here, are these level signals or edge signals? Well, they're level, okay, not edge. So now we're thinking uh, good chance that uh, good chance that we're we're intending uh, for combinational logic. Now here we have a non-blocking, so it's a little confusing, and we use non-blockings here too. So 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 here's the deal. If x equals one, then you assign one to b. Well, what if x doesn't equal one? What if b changes to trigger the execution of this, but x is zero? This is where 
you get into trouble because in combinational logic, that 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 wouldn't do anything. Uh, but in because the way this is set up, you have to have a latch to hold the value of B for the next time one of the signals changes. Since since you need now uh, the old value of B should continue to be output, and you, so you have to so it, so if you do this, it creates a latch because you didn't specify for the condition what if X is zero. Here you specified if X equals one great, you sign B to one, else B is zero. So that's fine. So now this, this will result in combinational logic. This one results in sequential logic. There, it creates a latch or a little flip-flop to, uh, to hold B. So you have to have, you have to account for all possibilities. And there are clearly a, the possibility X is zero and the possibility X is one. All right. So, uh, so we we've talked about this actually, you know, many times, uh, where we have a behavioral level, kind of a functional level, the logic level, the actual had you know transistor level, sort of component level, if you will, and then the actual layout on the integrated circuit level, where you where you have. N doped, P doped, metallized areas, and and uh, silicon dioxide insulators, um, and so we, you know, we are as much as you can. You want to operate up here, and only when you need to do you want to specify some of these things. And as much as you can, we want to let the synthesizer do the work. All right. So here's a behavioral description: A, B, and C are inputs. F equals A, B plus BC is an output. All right, so AB added together or with BC. So if B is zero, it's gonna be zero. Uh, so we have three inputs, ABC, we have this output. So here's a behavioral description. Now you can have a couple of different internal structures. You could set it up like this with NAND gates. You could set it up like this with two AND gates and an output OR gate. So this would be SOP form, and this would be NAND NAND form, or AND or this is NAND NAND. So when you write it like this, you're not specifying which of these actual uh, uh, structures is going to be realized. And in, and with our FPGA, it won't be either one of these. It'll be a lookup table. So totally, it'll be a ROM essentially, totally different. So how it gets how it gets implemented. Is, is we want to leave that as much as we can to the synthesizer. Um, so here, here's a state table. We have, a, we have a sequential machine, present state S0 through S6, so seven states. Our, our next state for X equals zero here and for X equals one here with a don't care. And our output Z for X equals zero and X equals one. Notice this is obviously a, a mealy machine because we have, we have uh, our, our output depends on our input. Otherwise there'd just be one column if it were more because the output just depends on the state. But in this case, it depends on the state and the next input. All right, and remember Moore's are always looking forward to that next input before you know what the actual output is supposed to be. And here it is, input X, output Z and a clock. So you know it's a, it's 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 a it's a sequential device. It's a it's a state machine. So so we're gonna we're gonna look at doing a code converter here. Four ways of modeling the code converter. Uh, you can do behavior with two processes, where you have a separate combination on sequential parts. You can have, do a behavior with a single process. Then you can do data flow with equations, and then you can do the structural. So let's look at that. So this will give you a little bit of an idea. How, how we can specify things differently. And of course, if we can, we wanna operate at the behavior level because it's less work and we leave more work for the synthesizer. So here's the idea, we have an, we have an input X that's gonna be our input code and our output Z is gonna be our output code. We have a combinational network here and we have a state register. The register remembers what state we're in 
and we have and that's where the clock the clock each clock post changes the state register to our next state and our inputs to this state register determine what the next state will be uh, and then this all feeds back to our combinational network that generates the net the new the next state uh, uh, the, the, the basically the d inputs for our flip flops and our outputs and again this is a, a mealy solution because our outputs have inputs from the next input and the current state. All right, so behavior model, two always blocks, a separate combination on sequential process. So, um, so we have, these are on the next page. So our output, our, our module list, we have an input X, a clock, and then we have an output Z. So that's our black box down here, input X, input clock, output Z. And then we define Z as a register. And then we have our, our three bits for our state, our current state, three bits for our next state. And then uh, these are all registers. We set things up initially, uh, which we can do with an FPGA, can't do, it with a, can't do it with an integrated circuit. With an integrated circuit, we'd have to do some fancy circuitry to get these things initialized to zero at power on. It's a little bit, you know, it, it is tricky and it's a problem. Uh, it definitely complicates designs. So we set the state to zero, zero, three bits, zero, 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 and the next state to zero, 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 zero. Then we have an always block for our combinational logic, which is going to result not in sequential logic, but combinational logic. And then we have an always block for sequential. Note this always block should have level signals, not a clock, and it should have blocking assignments theoretically. And this should have a clock and non blocking. All right. So let's look at it. This is our, uh, this is our, so we have a case statement here. Uh, so uh, basically if, if we're in state zero, so this is our case. So whatever state we're in, we'll, this will be the case we're doing. So in zero, uh, we, we test X, if it's a zero, then we set z equal to one and we set the next state to one. If x is not zero, if our input's not zero, then, uh, then we set z to, to zero instead of one and we go to next state two, all right? And then in next state, uh, in next state one, we test x again and so forth. And, uh, rather than go through this it's a little bit tedious but it's good to sort of walk through this and see and basically you can see in every state we do what we do this what this table says this is our this is our state table so if we're in state s0 and our input is zero we're going to go to s1 if our input is one we're going to s2 and we're going to output one and and zero and that's where we set z equal to one uh sorry z equal to zero for x equal to one uh, i'm sorry uh, z equal to zero for, yeah, for x equal one, z to, z to one for x equal zero. So we just do exactly, we just implement each of each row in our case statement. All right. And then uh, here's where, so this is going to result in combinational logic. Notice we have level signals here, no clock. And, but we're careful to account for all possibilities, all possibilities for X and for all states. And we have a default state just in case. Here we have our sequential and it's real simple. We just take the, we take the next state that's output from here, next state, next state, next state, next state, wherever the next state is, in this block on the clock edge, we change the state to the to the new next state, and this is how we shift. This is this is where we go from our current state to the next state, and then uh, now our next state has become our current state. Here we use a edge signal and a non-blocking, and here we use well we can use non-blockings here. Could also use blockings. All right, and the outputs are already done in our combinational, so it doesn't matter. All right, here's another way we can do it with a single process. 
uh, let's see, we're going to quit soon here. Um, well, let me, I'll, I'll leave, uh, we'll finish this up. We'll finish this up on Friday. It looks like it's time. Let me stop here and we'll, uh, we'll do the, just, I'll let me scroll through them. So here's, here's where we'd have uh, a single process, just one always block. And then we have this assignment statement at the end. And here's the always block, same case statement essentially, but now it's driven by the clock. So it's good to read through these and see how they did it differently. And you can compare one and two and see the differences. And then, uh, then you can also just uh, use, like we do in logic design, where we develop our formulas for our three flip-flop inputs and our output. And so you can do that with three flip-flops and you can drive those with this circuit. So you could describe it this way. That's fine. So here's for the flip-flop inputs and here's for the output. So, and this is basically the structural. This is data flow with equations. And then we had uh, two ways with uh, two processes and a single process data flow. Here's the data flow and here's the structural. This is what we did in logic design. Well, yeah. And we basically, if to implement this, you just, just do the equations. And then the structure model, you just have to do it like this and instantiate them. All right, let's let's quit with that. Um, hey, hey, Grant, give me one second to end my class. All right, so with that, um, let's uh, we'll stop today and uh, and then we'll pick back up on Friday. Uh, I'll give you one second for any questions. We good. All right, we'll see you guys later.